Although the food pyramid we know in the U.S. has since been replaced, recommended dietary guidelines go way back and in different forms. They can also be found in communities and schools and curriculums across the globe. While we like to think the people giving us advice have the public's best interest at heart, history has proven otherwise. Now, according to various sources, the food pyramid was influenced by different food lobbyists who had their own agendas. And Louis Slight can attest to this. While she came in full force, attempting to improve the health and livelihood of everyone in the U.S., this didn't align with the pockets of big business and their ever-growing ambition. With each dietary guideline that has came out since the 1970s, the food pyramid is the opposite of healthy. Now, we have a lot to unpack in this video, so we're going to break it down into four parts, and that's grain, meat, egg, and sugar industry being last. Let's get started. Now, lobbying includes an illegal attempt by individuals or groups to influence government policy or action. This definition specifically excludes bribery. Because attempts to control this influence have been viewed by corporations and legislators as infringement on basic rights, Congress has found it difficult to regulate. Now, these mostly come down to agriculture lobbyists, processed food industry lobbyists, and regular food lobbyists like the meat and dairy industries. In 1916, the first ever food guide was created in the U.S., but this was just for children. Then, in 1917, another version came out for families. In 1943 to 1955, the Basic 7 was created where common foods were simply put in a chart such as dairy, meat, veggies, and fun fact, butter was its own food group. However, no serving sizes were defined and this was ultimately considered to be too general and possibly unhealthy. Now, the Basic 4 was then alive from 1956 to 1979 and around this time, big lobbying started happening. Now, just to be clear, you have the dietary guidelines which show specific recommendations and comes in pamphlet form. Then you have visual representations which includes the basic seven, basic four, food wheel, food pyramid, my plate, etc. Now, Louise Light was the director of dietary guidance and nutrition education research at the USDA in the 1980s. In this role, she was responsible for the team that created the original food pyramid guide which emphasized eating more fruits and vegetables, less meat, salt, sugary foods, differentiated good fats from bad fats, and limited additive rich factory foods. As far as nutrition, this was pretty good. The food pyramid basically went from this to this. Lewis and her team submitted the food pyramid in what was some of her best work to something that was not just opposite, but offensive. Our recommendation of three to four daily servings of whole grain breads and cereals was changed to a whopping 6 to 11 servings, which would form the base of the food pyramid. This was a head nod to the processed wheat and corn industries. Now, Louise Light's nutritionist group had originally placed baked goods made with white flour, including crackers and sweets, and other low nutrient foods laden with sugars and fats at the peak of the pyramid, recommending that they be eaten sparingly. Now, she says, to our alarm, in the revised food guide, they were now made part of the pyramid base. And yet, in one more assault to dietary logic, changes were made to the wording of the dietary guidelines, from eat less to avoid too much, giving more concession to the processed food industry. Now, highly profitable fun foods or junk foods would now count as part of the recommended daily profile. Now, Light later learned, as she suspected, that a spot on the food pyramid was sold to the highest bear. Now, to really understand just how this whole thing came to be, we have to go back to the 1960s. In October of 1963, President Kennedy mentioned that Russia might buy as much as 250 million worth of U.S. wheat in the following months, and that's exactly what happened. The Cold War was ongoing during the 1960s, and due to the Soviet Union's poor planning, they would face massive starvation if they didn't do something quick. So, the United States sold them approximately 440 million bushels of wheat to the Soviet Union for around 700 million. And the deal allowed the Soviets to buy American grain on credit over a three year period. This was the greatest grain deal in history. Now, Earl Butts is an important figure in this story. He was a secretary of agriculture at the time, and he did something that many people believe was a move to get him reelected for his position for four more years. 
But in order to do that, the president at the time had to win presidency again. And being in the position he was in, along with the grain deal that was ongoing, he had the most brilliant but calculated idea. Because farmers were so influential, his plan included getting them to support President Nixon in the presidency. Now, he got to work quickly and took many of the restrictions off of farmers who grew grain. So now they could grow as much as they wanted. Additionally, anytime farmers sold grain to Russia, the transaction was now subsidized. But that's not all. Given Butt's ambitious mentality, he didn't believe in small farmers and encouraged farmers to go big or go home. And because farmers were making so much money now, more than they ever had before, President Nixon had their vote and Earl Butts got to keep his job for another few years. Now, when the Soviet Union no longer needed the grain, that extra subsidy would be gone soon. So Butts had to figure out what to do with all the extra grain and how to keep farmers making money. Now, by convincing the American public that grain should be eaten abundantly, America did. More grains were being recommended than fruits and vegetables, and unsurprisingly, he made a derogatory remark later, which was overheard and led to his resignation. Go figure. Now, later in the 1980s, the new USDA Secretary of Agriculture, John Block, remarked during his confirmation hearings that he was not so sure government should be getting into telling people what they should or shouldn't eat. And one of his first acts had been to close a USDA nutrition research unit. Now, the reasons for the closure are not entirely clear, but some experts suggest it was part of a broader effort to cut government spending on nutrition research and shift the focus of the USDA towards agriculture production, which he was a part of. Now, prior to his political career, Block was a grain and hog farmer from West Central Illinois and served as a leader in the Illinois Farm Bureau. But before we keep going, hi, my name is Kim and welcome to The Green Lab Coach. If you enjoy living a healthy lifestyle backed by science, Make sure to subscribe and also don't forget to hit the like button to help the algorithm and the bell to help save the world one human and animal at a time. Let's get started. Now, presently, lobbying is regulated entirely by an act that was passed in 1946. The act simply requires individuals or groups who lobby members of Congress to report their identities and sources of funds, which of course will be widely ignored. About 8,000 individuals currently register as lobbyists. Among these, 5% represent food companies. Now, this table provides a partial list of lobbying groups. They are not equal in influence. For the most part, food producers and commodity associations are much better funded than advocacy groups. Beef and dairy lobbies are especially influential, and they are well funded and distributed among a great many states, each with its own representative in the House of Senate. So you can see the difference here. Now, let's talk about meat. As you can see, in 1977, the recommendation in these guidelines were to decrease consumption of meat, but members of the select committee that were representing states with large meat constituents had a cow. They demanded changes in the text. This was not the first time that meat producers demanded and succeeded in obtaining additional hearings to express their views. Now, these hearings were notable for their explicit statements of self-interest. A National Cattlemen Association representative, for example, stated that the term decrease with respect to meat consumption should be considered a bad word. Senator McGovern, who wasn't a part of the meat industry, was even quoted saying that he did not want to disrupt the economic situation of the meat industry and engage in a battle with the industry that we could not win. Therefore, the committee revised the report and published a second edition where the text changed from decreased consumption of meat and increased consumption of poultry and fish to decrease consumption of animal fat and choose meats, poultry, and fish, which will reduce saturated fat intake." Unquote. Now, Governor McGovern apparently had the public's best interest at heart, but in his eyes, the USDA would never win and history has proven this. Now, this revision was still a little unclear to some and the USDA went to revise it again. So in 1979, when Healthy People came out, recommending relatively less red meat. It elicited, once again, a storm of protest where meat reps said that the diet fat cholesterol heart disease hypothesis is not scientifically valid. And representatives of the meat, dairy, and egg industries offered to fund research to counter what was perceived as a scientific threat to their industries that was growing. Now, the Healthy People publication became the last federal document to use the words eat less when referring to meat. 
As we can see over the years, the text on meat has changed from decreased consumption of meat to choose lean meats to six ounces to seven ounces. Also in 1979, the publication Food was actually the most requested USDA publication, more so than healthy people. Now, after the 1980 election, however, under pressure from representatives of the meat, dairy, and egg industries, who objected both to the advice to reduce fat and cholesterol and to the placement of their products below fruits and vegetables, which like, come on now, you definitely belong there, and below grains as well, USDA officials decided to delete the entire chapter on fat and cholesterol from what was expected to be the second publication in the series Food 2. Now, ultimately, the USDA decided against proceeding with the series and gave the completed page boards to the American Dietitian Association, which would represent them in a better light. Now, the famous food pyramid stood from 1992 to 2005, but it wasn't without problems, of course. Lobbying caused the food pyramid to be postponed by one year. When the food pyramid did come out, it had increased the meat recommendation from six ounces to seven ounces as stated earlier. Now, in a change that pleased food producers, the text was also changed to foods that contain fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol, such as meats, milk, cheese, and eggs, also contain high quality protein and are our best sources of certain vitamins and minerals, unquote. Big food wins again. Now, I also want to point something out. The problem with even the healthiest and organic meats nowadays, which would be poultry and fish, is that if cooked at high temperatures, they produce carcinogens, and the chemical research in toxicology can back this up. That's why if you're a meat eater, it's important to not charbroil or fry your meat, but cook at low temperature only. Next up is the egg industry, which also lobbied the food pyramid in the past. And this can be seen when the USDA categorized eggs as meat within the food pyramid. But it gets worse. Members of the egg industry have also been involved in the development of the guidelines themselves, which is quite beneficial. Do they actually believe in the product or are we just working for the product? Now, the egg industry has also been accused of influencing the USDA's dietary guidelines regarding cholesterol. In 2016, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, a nonprofit that promotes a vegan diet, sued the USDA for apparent inappropriate influence by members of the egg industry. Importantly, however, this committee does have its own interest in mind as well. The nonprofit promotes animal welfare, but at the same time, for whatever reason, they never sued the meat or dairy industries, which they are also against. Here are the funding groups for the studies. I've put a U by every study where the effect on, of dietary cholesterol on blood cholesterol was unfavorable. You can make the effect disappear. If you are the egg industry and you fund a study in which you bring people in who are already eating a large amount of dietary cholesterol, you bring in a small group of people so that you don't have statistically significant results and you can declare uh, null results. Now, the merit of the committee lies in the fact that a judge ruled, quote, the court holds that there is no meaningful standard for deciding whether certain scientists exercised or whether the USDA and HHS sufficiently guarded against inappropriate influence in the dietary guidelines, unquote. And why isn't there? While meaningful standards exist everywhere else, apparently there isn't one for big food. For at least two decades, the dietary guidelines included a specific recommendation on cholesterol, clearly stating that Americans should eat no more than 300 milligrams per day of cholesterol, which is less than two eggs. Now, the strict advice to limit cholesterol had been a critical recurring part of the guidelines. The fact that they were suddenly left out of this new draft showed just how much sway members of the egg industry held over food policy. Now, even though the case got thrown out, the USDA released its final guidelines and what was now included, however, was a slightly different recommendation on cholesterol consumption. Instead of the 300 milligram limit or removal of it completely, the guidelines advise people to eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible. This was something of a small victory for the committee. We were pleased, says the committee. It wasn't perfect, but at least it was something. Now, as you can see, this is a reason the guidelines will always have to be updated. Not just because of new scientific findings per se, but because there will always be wrath from both big food and smaller advocacy groups. 
Now, overall, recommendations had gotten as lax as eat a variety of foods, maintain ideal weight, avoid too much fat, sugar, and sodium, if you drink alcohol, do so in moderation, basically always leaving room for exception. Balance is what we call it. This kept the industries happy, just as they had been since 1958 thanks to joining together in protest. Now, foods of animal origin, such as meat, dairy, and eggs, Together, they provide nearly 45% of the total fat, 60% of the saturated fat, and most of the cholesterol in the U.S. food supply. Now, all of these policy shifts that were occurring as a result of all this lobbying were happening as nutrition scientists were reaching findings that reduced fat intake would in fact improve the health of the public. Now, this isn't to say that all fats are bad by any means, and we haven't even touched on processed food avocados, coconut oil, and nut butters have beneficial properties, and there's many more. But coronary heart disease, certain cancers, diabetes, stroke, and others have become leading causes of death and disability. Prominent studies like a China study have shown accurate correlations between eating little animal-derived foods and having a low risk of disease or diseases that are plaguing the United States. And it isn't until a reader, such as you and I, takes a deep dive into the belly of the guidelines that you actually discover that consuming less red meat and processed meat can significantly decrease one's risk of obesity, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and certain cancers. Even then, the document is written towards nutritionists and health professionals, making it difficult for the average American to understand, let alone to apply to their daily food choices. Now, the last one I want to mention is the sugar and processed food industry. According to research, the sugar industry lobbied the food pyramid in the 1960s and influenced the dietary guidelines in favor of sugar and against fat. Now, what I mean is that they funded research that downplayed the risk of sugar in coronary heart disease and paid scientists to suggest that cutting fat out of American diets was the best way to address coronary heart disease. Now, in 2015, as the USDA was releasing its 2015-2020 dietary guidelines, 255 clients lobbied the food industry, releasing 1,176 reports. Some of the lobbyists' largest clients came as no surprise. We have Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Monsanto, Nestle, and McDonald's, to name a few. In 2015, Coca-Cola alone spent $8.67 million on lobbying. The meat processing and production industry spent almost $5 million. The dairy industry spent $7 million, and the food products manufacturing industry spent a whopping $19 million. Now, when dealing with massive multinational corporations such as these, you can be sure that large sums of cash are going to be involved. Now, from the basic seven to the food pyramid, no matter how much the USDA tweaked food guides, someone in the meat, eggs, or dairy industry was always unhappy, and is still true till this day and they're very influential. They have an effect on everything, from how companies label their foods to what types of foods are included in school lunch programs. Whatever the US government tells Americans to eat is bound to be controversial. Now, one view of lobbying is that it is a healthy influence within the political system that keeps Congress informed about issues, stimulates public debate, and encourages participation in the political process. From this perspective, lobbyists aren't the bad guys. Now, it must be emphasized that lobbying activists are entirely legal and available to consumer groups as well as to food producers, but the playing field definitely isn't level. Food producers have a lot more resources, and these issues is what impairs the USDA's ability to educate the public about diet and health. Now, if these functions were transferred to a unit less tied to food industry groups, the unit could actually focus on what is good nutrition and can educate the public. Now, also worth considering are more forceful advocacy of consumer perspectives to Congress, reform of lobbying laws, and public education about the extent of lobbying influence. Now, what is at stake here is no less than the health of the public, especially during an era of skyrocketing chronic disease, and it just keeps going up. It's up to us to make a difference and make our voices heard. In the end, the choice is yours.